If you're looking to move out of your parents' place, you could really cut expenses by bundling your car and renter's insurance with Progressive, which is good because your little brother has gotten really territorial. You're blood-related. You'd think it would be fine to share food in the fridge. I mean, who writes their name on every individually wrapped slice of cheese, Tyler? Still, you've got to admire the commitment. So bundle your renter's and car insurance with Progressive and use the savings to help you move out and have all the cheese you want. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie, reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 44 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Digital Federal Credit Union, better known to all of us as DCU. And DCU believes that financial education empowers individuals to achieve their goals and improve their financial footing. And that's why, for a second year, DCU is sponsoring EverFi's Financial Literacy B, an opportunity for students to have some fun and learn important financial concepts all from the comfort of home. In just 30 minutes, students will take part in short, interactive online lessons that will help them better understand how to save, how to budget, and how to invest in their future. Plus, they have a chance to win up to $10,000 in college scholarships. The B runs through April 15th, and for more information, visit dcu.org slash financial B. That's B-E-E. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by mistresscarry.com, which is where you can find the archive of every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast, plus every episode of Cocktails in the War Room, which is the weekly video show that streams live on my Facebook page every Tuesday night at 8.30. You'll also find the events calendar that's filled with live streaming concerts and most recently, some actual concert dates that are happening in person. Plus, you'll find my photo galleries and my blog and plus the online Mistress Carrie store filled with t-shirts, hoodies, beanies, mugs, barware, stickers, and so much more. Just remember, for all things Mistress Carrie, just go to mistresscarrie.com. Okay. I have known Todd Whitener since he was a teenager when his band got signed and took over rock radio nationwide. You may not know his name, but you know the band and the music from Days of the New. The band members then launched the band Tantric. And now, Todd and his band members have started a new project called Bliss Creek, and their debut album came out this past February. After all these years, I had a chance to sit down and talk to Todd about what it was like to become a rock phenomenon as a teenager and the ups and downs that the band has dealt with over the years, plus how he's weathered the storm of COVID and what made him want to jump back in with a new band and launch something brand new. We talked about songwriting and music and his great memories of his time with WAF. He couldn't be a nicer guy. And it was so awesome to catch up with him and to see how amazing he's doing because he's such a talented musician and songwriter. So if you're a fan of Days of the New or if you're a fan of Tantric, you're going to be a fan of Bliss Creek. So allow me to introduce you to Todd Whitener from Bliss Creek. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. The hair is so lovely. Good eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Food Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. 
alert on your end that I'm recording you. Todd, how are you? Thank you for coming on the podcast. It is my pleasure. Long time no talk. It's so great to see you. You can't see me, but I can see you in this uh, platform. How long have you and I known each other? Like, Do you remember when we met? It had to be uh, mid to late 90s, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I was on the air when Days of the New broke, but I was at AAF. So, I mean, that's 25 yeah, I mean, years ago. That's right. I mean, that would have put us, yeah, 97. I would, if I just had to throw a, a number out there, I'd say 1997 was probably the first time we crossed paths. Yeah, and, and then I was on the promotions team at WAF, and it was part of our job to go to all of the shows and when the radio station had concerts we were part of the crew and in that time days of the new went from a band that no one had ever heard of to the band no one could stop talking about it's pretty crazy it is so surreal and something that was so unexpected for all of us you know i think especially being a teenager and growing up you uh imagine you the most amazing things that can happen. But then when the magic actually happens in real life, it catches, it caught me off guard to where it felt like I was living in a dream, to be honest with you. Like I I still, to this day, I look back and I look back at some of the memories, some of the pictures and um, some of the awesome accolades we were able to achieve. And I'm, it just seems surreal, honestly, that it happened. It, it, it's about as real as the dream I had last night when I think back on it. The story of a of a rock band normally is the story of um, years of being poor, years of sleeping on someone else's couch, years of struggle and inspiration and almost giving up and coming back. And then you finally get to this point. Your story is a little different because it happened so fast And you guys were so young that everyone just kind of like when we would sit down and talk to you guys and be like, oh, the album's platinum again and this and that. And you guys were just kind of laughing about it from what I remember being like, yeah, this is kind of crazy for us. And how do you think that shaped you as a person now and how you look at music now having achieved such a high level of success at such an early age. You know, one of the silver linings that came about was that we did, it it did happen so fast that we didn't have time to think about it or get nervous about it or get worked up about what was happening because it seemingly happened overnight. And so we were just in it. We were just trudging through it and playing shows and uh, having fun, you know, and uh, making the most of the situation and living in the moment truly uh obviously we had our ups and downs but uh we definitely lived in the moment i mean i i'll I'll recall when we had that awesome opportunity to open uh, the summer of 1998 we opened for metallica on their um, amphitheater tour and growing up listening to metallica my whole life i mean i was on top of the world in that moment of time and there wasn't one single show that i didn't miss where as soon as we got done playing I walked out to front of house and watched every minute of every single show and just took it in and just like looked around, you know, and absorbed this feeling like here I am, like in this moment, this is real life. Like, this is crazy. It's super crazy. And, um, when, when we, it's, it's so crazy. Cause we didn't, we, we didn't go through what you described as far as the, uh, you know, hopping in a van and, uh, you know, having years of unsuccessful, you know, shots in the industry. It, we were in high, uh, I mean, high school, I was a senior in high school when the deal happened. So crazy. um, You know, we were still all poor. None of us came from money. So at least we experienced how that felt, but we definitely kind of shot out like a, of a cannon when it came to the music stuff, but I'll never forget. So it was Scott lit was one of the most important names that was introduced to us early on. 
Uh, and he is the guy who ended up being, he was the part owner of Outpost Records, who was with Geffen at the time, and uh, was also a producer of bands like R.E.M., Nir uh, Nirvana. Um, we had a manager at the time, Rick Smith, who sent us uh, his name, and he said, hey, uh, this guy, Scott Litt, I sent him the music he's interested in coming and watching you guys perform. And so we're like, okay, you know, being a 16, 17 year old, we're like, Scott Litt, hmm, that name meant absolutely nothing to me, to be honest with it. We're like, who is Scott Litt? And so there was no Google back then. So we just had to start asking people, you know, like, I don't know, what is, what is who is Scott? And they told us and they filled us in on the, in the, the filled in the blanks, like, hey, this is, uh, this guy's the real deal. And, he came because we only played a show here and there. Like we would play, uh, um, like uh, we played one thing called a Harvest Showcase, for example, uh, in Louisville there where we were kind of based out of at the time. Uh, that was a, a fundraising effort for, for homeless. Um, we would do um, random smaller things like at a coffee shop or whatever. So there were no like big shows. We literally had played a handful of shows, uh, when all this kind of took off. And so Scott came and watched us play in Travis's basement. Uh, cause we didn't have anything lined up. He's like, it doesn't matter to me. He's like, I'll just come and watch you all practice. And, uh, that's where the magic began was literally, he came and watched us and like an hour into watching us, he's like, all right, this is the real deal. Like, we're going to make this happen, guys. Are you all ready? And we're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love that he asked you, are you all ready? <laughs> Having no idea, even himself as an established person in the industry, no one could have predicted how quickly the band took off and how huge the band became so quickly. I mean, if, if you had told people, oh, this is what's going to happen, they would have said, I don't believe you. I think that's totally accurate. And I've never asked him directly, but I bet that he probably was shocked to see how well it went in the beginning. It just kind of something happened. You know, it's one of those um, the stars aligned for us moments where it's just right place, right time. And maybe if anything had happened six months earlier or later, we wouldn't have had the beautiful things that unfolded unfold for us to make uh, that moment of time real i talked to kevin martin from candlebox on the on the podcast a while back he told me this great story about how they opened up for rush and described a lot of it the way that you're talking about opening up for metallica that you're just like i can't believe we're on this tour this is insane and he talked about how neil peart would watch their set from the side and then give them advice on song structuring throughout the set and kind of how to move the show along did the guys from metallica or any of the other big bands that you guys opened up for in the early days do that with you guys i don't recall advice given necessarily but i do remember seeing some of the guys on the side stage uh, some some of the metallica guys uh, side stage certain shows and it would kind of freak me out. And so I started not paying attention to what was happening on the side of the stage so that I would actually <laughs> hit the right notes. Um, but there were, we had some really cool moments. Like there were a cool, a uh, couple cool uh, after show kind of mid tour parties that happened where they kind of introduced us to, to rock, to the rock world parties. And, uh, there were a couple cool moments where like, you know, outside of the setting of the stage and all that where like some cool advice was given uh, to a couple of the guys. Um, but just being in their presence, honestly, I was like a sponge. And that was part of the reason that I watched them day in and day out was that I wanted to try to figure out and reverse engineer what the secret sauce was, what they had figured out and their work ethic and see how they operate from morning to night um, and how they treat their fans. And uh, so I just tried to take it all in. And, and so I could apply a little bit of that knowledge that I was able to acquire in, into, you know, our trajectory at the time, hopefully. You went to rock and roll college with Metallica. Man, <laughs> that's seriously it. I mean, there's no better college to go to in my estimation. Right? <laughs> and even though even though the band happened so quickly and found success so quickly, that doesn't mean that you haven't had your struggles as a musician 
I mean, obviously, everybody knows by now the struggles with Days of the New and with Travis specifically. And and then you guys decided to start a new project with Tantric. And there there are bands out there that have been able to, to replace a lead singer and change the dynamic. I mean, you know, a band like Audio Slave bringing in a, a different singer and changing. It's a completely new thing. But when you're working with musicians that you were in previous bands with, it's the same but not the same. And you guys found success in that way, too, for a long time. And then then you were quiet for a while. And at least from my perspective, you were quiet for a while. And then all of a sudden, I find out about this new band coming out of a pandemic. And I was like, oh, my God, that is amazing that these guys are back at it. So talk to me about that quiet time and like and what you were doing and where you were and what you were working on that maybe i hadn't heard about you know i think for for the most part we all took a break from the music industry in itself and for me i'll speak for myself it was it was much needed because along the way and 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 we did have the blessing of kind of having two runs of it uh, at it with two different singers and um we never, as far as what my vision was, we never hit our ceiling with either band. I think we 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 came up short of that f- uh, in both ventures f- due to internal problems with both bands. Um, but because of the struggles of uh, everything from our our own band internal struggles to working with uh, the, you know some of the wrong players were in the mix when it came to the people that are, you know, kind of on your sideline, helping you get from point A to point B to point C. Um, it just, it, it got to a point where music wasn't fun anymore as far as the industry and, you know, that rat race of getting out there and constantly touring. And, um, you know, we, we've never uh, had the blessing of getting to the place to where we, you know, we've, uh, it's become a, a giant financial success to us because we've always, be, you know, come right up to the right up to that point to where like, all right, the, we could really break through now and, and turn this into a lifelong career. And then uh, we always uh, in the past had seemed to find a reason to self implode, so to speak. And uh, like I said, for a multitude of different reasons. So when I unplugged, I really just needed to reset everything in my life and uh I guess I would liken it to a spiritual venture because I just went back to like normal life again. You know, for a while I was building decks and sunrooms. I worked at Ford Motor Company for a while. Where were Uh, you living at the time? At the, for a while I lived uh, in Louisville, Kentucky still. I've lived here in Nashville. I live in Nashville currently. I've been here for uh, going on 10 years now, but we, we found ourselves in a place where, um, we had gone our separate directions. When I say we, I'm referring to it, Jesse and Matt, and myself. So Jesse Vest, the bass player, Matt Tall, the drummer. Uh, we have always stuck together from the beginning, uh, even from Days of the New to Tantric to uh, to now. And we each kind of had our own life stuff to figure out. Matt uh, ended up uh, battling legal trouble for a long time. He was locked up for a long time, which he, he said, you know, he's okay with me mentioning that now I've never mentioned it in the past, but he's kind of like getting to that new place where he's, he's gotten over the hump and he's facing those, you know, those, those demons and he's staring it down and he's making sure it doesn't happen again in his life. So, uh, he, between him going through that, Jesse had to take care of some family issues at, at home, which, um, you know, I, I don't know if he wants me to discuss, but he, he had some things. He, he just had to step up and be a dad and uh, take care of the family, you know, and do do what's right as a human being, as a father. So uh, that that left uh, me kind of sitting there and just burnt. And um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's how did all of my- that affect the three of you? Because you talk about how the three of you had been able to stick together through Days of the New, through Tantric, through everything that had happened. I mean, you want to talk about putting a friendship, never mind a band, through the ringer. But outside of music, you guys were friends from the time you were kids. 
how how trying was that uh, just on your friendship and trying to what to keep that all together when you were going through all of this unrecognizable craziness that's happening around you interestingly enough it wasn't trying at all in our friendship i gotta say we we found ourselves in a place where uh we just all naturally knew that we just needed to travel in different directions for a while and kind of go on our own missions and uh i can't tell you that i knew that we would get back together because i honestly kind of figured that we weren't going to have any more musical ventures again for the rest of our lives because here uh, we've just we've gone in these different directions they they still reside in uh southern indiana i live in nashville we've been carving different paths over the years and um this pandemic as you you said it was it almost um for us was the reason really that we were able to find ourselves back together again and creating music again because we if it was going to happen it would require some crazy act of nature that would make that happen because with the busyness of each of our lives i don't see how we could have come together uh had the world not been put on pause for a while can you tell me what it is about nashville because I can't tell you the number of musicians, rock musicians, because Nashville was a country town for a really long time. I can't tell you how many rock bands I've talked to that are either living in Nashville, living around Nashville, going to Nashville to record. How long have you been there and what has the transition been like from being a traditionally country town to this invasion of rock bands that's happening there? I, you're right. I mean, there are so many rock bands here. It's in crazy. It's it's crazy, and I and I keep uh, running into many of them and befriend them and like because we're all like like brothers now. We see each other like, hey, what's up, man? Like, because it's know. not that big of a city. I mean, it's a major city, but the way everyone describes it is that it's still kind of a small town feel. It is because once you're connected with. Uh, someone in the industry, whether it be a studio owner, a publishing owner, or somebody who knows us, like all of a sudden you'll be at a, a friend's barbecue. And then like, that's how, um, like I met Ray Lazier, the drummer of Corn, for example. Uh, I met him at a friend's barbecue and we've been friends ever since. Like I showed up and uh, I was like, man, he kind of looked familiar. And we started talking and then, yeah, it turns out, you know, we know a lot of the same people and all this stuff and, and things like that just happen just randomly that uh, I don't think would happen anywhere else. But I think that people, musicians in general, no matter what their genre have gravitated toward here in the last decade or so. Uh, and, and I have been here about nine, almost 10 years now um, because of the fact that Nashville has been able to, in a time when in Los Angeles and New York, when like the studio scene, the live studio or recording scene was thriving. Uh, it, it has now over the past decade plus, uh, been kind of diminishing and and more and more studios are closing and it's it's becoming you know more and more um pe people recording at home or in simplistic uh places and then they just send it off to have it mixed by someone or whatever which means that the studios just one by one are just disappearing well and technology Nashville is making it so that you can have a studio in your i mean look this is mchq i've got basically a radio station now to myself it's incredible. It I is. Mean, it, it really is. And that landscape has changed so drastically. Um, but Nashville has been able to hang on to, and in part, I think, because of the way that uh, the country music industry has, has decided to hang on to the art form of uh, recording in an actual studio uh, through an actual large format console. That um, And they a rely lot of, a lot on, you know, the, the like in rock for the most part, the band works on the music themselves, writes their own songs, goes into a studio, records it. Country music has always been very open about artists that don't write their own music, songwriters that don't record music, they write songs for other people. And, and that part of the business, I think, was always different for country music as opposed to, to rock, I think. Do you agree? 
Absolutely agree. And, you know, I used to think to myself when I would see an artist who didn't seem interested in having their own um, writing credits on their own albums. And I used to scratch my head, like, why are they missing an opportunity to A, be creative, but then B, have another stable source of income. If you have a hit, then you, you know, it's because after all, we do have families to feed and stuff, just like normal people. And uh, I would just ponder like what are why would they want to do that but now the landscape has changed so much in the industry that there's actually not very much money to be made for songwriters not like there used to be as far as uh, album sales go anyway um so that source of income has greatly it will, will shrunk <laughs> it's, it's a lot smaller uh reservoir so to speak to draw from um and so now it it really is a dependent industry on touring and getting bodies in the seats, which makes it especially difficult right now when the people can't go and play in an amphitheater that seats 15,000 people. So it's, we're at a weird place. Can I ask you this question? And I, I don't, I, I don't want you to get specific. I'm not trying to be disrespectful when we talk about money, but you're in a really unique situation. You, you, had a band back in the the mid to late 90s that released songs that are part of the fabric of rock radio and always will be. And you sold millions of records the old-fashioned way before the internet and, and downloading and streaming really took off. And there is a huge push with artists now to get the streaming services to pay adequate royalties for streams to the artists and the creators of the music. As someone that has songwriting credits on songs that are so massive and we're getting radio play everywhere. I mean, Touch, Peel, and Stand, you can't listen to a rock radio station and not hear that song every day because it still holds up. Can you talk as specifically as you're comfortable about the difference between getting royalty checks at the beginning of the band to... Years later, still getting money off of those older songs because people were still purchasing the music and radio airplay in the traditional sense versus releasing songs now or even the days of the new and tantric stuff now with streaming. Because like I talked to, I talked to Nuno Betancourt and of course, you know, extreme more than words like that song's getting played a billion times a day still to this day. And he talked about, you know, how the artists need to be there. There needs to be a different financial model for streaming because nobody's really buying music anymore, but people are listening to music more than ever. It is a model that is, it favors corporatism for sure it does not favor the artists um in regards to streaming it and it is it's it's a completely different world than it used to be so you know back when we started at least you had a fighting chance to make uh some money off of album sales like i i, I tell the story sometimes like i'll never forget um i think back in uh, december of 1996 98 i believe was our our biggest selling month of uh for the days of the new record and uh i think in in one particular week of december of 1998 it might have been 1997 but it doesn't matter we sold 50 i think it was 56,000 copies in one week and so i i look back on that and i'm like wow that i mean that's a huge accomplishment that is a lot of albums for one week of sales for a brand new band brand new band and that would have you at number one on like all the charts right now and uh, unless like taylor swift put out an album the same week or whatever but like generally that would have you like number one across the board and on everything these days well, that was good enough to register us at number 53 on the top 200 back then, 53 for that week. And those are the, you know, in the days of the boy bands and, and all of that and Mariah Care. Britney Spears uh, and Mariah Care, all of that. Yeah, that's right. They were all selling a million copies the first week plus. Yeah, in, exactly. They were all selling seven figures in a week. Like the top 10 of Billboard were all selling seven figures of albums per week 
Um, and as an artist, th there is, depending on your, your record deal and how much money it took for you to get to the position where you release an album and how much promotion the record company dumped in and also how honest your record company is and with their accounting, and that's a big thing. Um, for m many artists won't even make money unless they sell 5 million albums uh, back in back in those days. And so uh, there wasn't just money flying around back then either, unless you got to a, a certain point or were super business savvy, which we were not. Um, but to your point about what Nuno said and this business model now, the streaming, it doesn't really pay you anything. I mean, you know, Spotify, for example, I mean, because these metrics, you can, anybody can Google this stuff. Uh, something like a million streams equates to like a couple thousand dollars or whatever. Yeah, it's like 0 0.00138 cents per stream. or It's something ludicrous. We talk about it all the time in the podcast and on my video show every week, Cocktails in the War Room. Like, it's shocking to me. And there were just... There were protests outside of all the Spotify offices and the artists are asking for one cent a stream, which would be a, a significant raise. But to the fans of the music, it seems ridiculous that it is a cent, it's, it's not a it's big deal. It's crazy. And, you know, artists like um, my limited knowledge of, you know, Taylor Swift's stance when she did decide to not have an album on some of the streaming platforms for a little bit. I think that it was in protest of the streaming rate royalties and stuff. Um, unfortunately, there's not enough of that going on. And, you know, you, you get somebody like us, it, you're almost, you're, you're stuck in this situation because um, for us to protest and not put our music out there only hurts us. It doesn't hurt anybody else. Well, this is a really important point because when Napster hit, I was on the air at AAF, and when Napster hit, Lars and Metallica became the enemy of technology in, in the public consciousness, that this big, rich band that was making all this money was trying to deny regular people access to this music. And what you're talking about is I stood up for Metallica on the air. I, I don't think they handled everything exactly right, but the message and what they were standing up for was correct. And that the songwriters, the people that are making the music, it's a tangible product. It's an art form and you need to be compensated for it. I took a lot of shit for it. But what you're saying is exactly why I wanted to bring this up. If it's not for huge artists like Metallica, like Taylor Swift, a few months ago, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin came out and talked about the royalties of Spotify. Everybody can say that Jimmy Page should have plenty of money by now. So why is he Why is he even saying anything? You're Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin. It doesn't matter. But what you're saying, and this is why I wanted to bring up the point, if not for those big established artists making this point, artists like you and smaller, newer bands they don't have any clout to protest anything. You need these big, huge, high-profile, quote-unquote, rich artists to be the ones to stick up for all the other artists, correct? That's absolutely correct. And, and kudos to you for always standing up for what Metallica believed in because they were, they were pioneers in my estimation. I, I think that anyone um, who would criticize them back in the day for what they did... Um, they just didn't have all of the knowledge. Well, they just said you're being their, greedy. You're just yeah. being this greedy band. And okay, fine. Even if it was just out of greed, they get the right to be greedy about the money that gets made off their own music, right? I mean, who else deserves that money? Yeah, and and I would hope to think that they saw what was coming, you know, and they knew that like somebody with just like you said, with power, with clout has to stand up for everybody else and and really needs to be a collective effort. And that would be difficult to do because mus musicians as a whole uh, have not been. Uh, historically known to be business savvy and and very good at uh, it's hard to be good at everything and <laughs> you can be a really great accountant but not write a hit song or or do correct. an amazing guitar solo like you can't be good at everything 
<laughs> yeah, that's why you hopefully hire the right people around you that make you exactly. look good and make you look like you're good at what you're doing. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's something that all I can do is hope and pray that the, the model changes because it's not sustainable for artists. I mean, somebody like us, it's you, we we put this out um because it's fun and we love to make music but we certainly if we depended on if we weren't able to go out and support it and and gain success through uh people showing up at shows and things like that uh we couldn't sustain ourselves by you know from getting streaming royalty checks i mean we well would... that's what i said back in the day i said listen i because i used to be a roadie before i was a dj and i was like look the you know tour buses aren't free Diesel fuel's not free, pyro's not free, roadies aren't free. The, this all needs to get paid for in order for the bands to roll into town and for you to go to the show. So unless, and this is what I said back in the day, and again, I took a lot of shit for it, but I was right. Unless you want to pay 50 bucks for a t-shirt and 120 bucks for a concert ticket, stop stealing the fucking music. I mean, and where are we now? You're you're totally Paying right. 50 bucks for a t-shirt and 120 bucks for a concert ticket because like you're saying that that's the lifeblood of at least rock bands now. I mean, I can't I can't attest for, you know, a post Malone type model where the they're they've got to be making money off streams because the music is just everywhere. Mm-hmm. And the sync licenses in, you know, television and movies and all of that stuff. But for a working rock band, you got to hit the road. And right. the benefit of that, though, and I want you to tell me if this is correct or not, the benefit of the rock band is that the pop star that gets all that early money off the streams and is the flash in the pan doesn't necessarily have the guaranteed longevity of career because rock fans when they love you, they love you forever and will support you forever. And you could go out 10 years, 15 years, 20 years with that hit song. And if they love you, they'll still come out and see you where that's not necessarily the same thing for the pop acts, right? I, I don't guess so. I don't know enough about the pop business model to really. Yeah, neither say do one I. I'm making generalities, but, but. <laughs> yeah. But I, the one thing that it did spur this this whole thought and this conversation in my mind is, I've had this blessing of having uh, firsthand to be able to observe. While I've been in Nashville, I've worked for a country artist named Dirks Bentley. I worked on his road crew, and. Again, like I did with the Metallica thing, I, I've always been like a sponge and observed how he operates and try to any any of anything that I can learn uh, to make sure that I, I get to better our musical situation and achieve our dreams. I'm going to do it. And he is a person who, like we've said, I mean, he. He didn't have any of the giant hits in the beginning. Uh, he's a guy who just toured, 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 toured. Um, he had one hit that uh, this drunk on a plane song that was a a big song for him that kind of increased his crowd size almost overnight. I believe. I think he went from playing six thousand seat places to eighteen thousand seat places, seemingly seemingly overnight. But here's a guy who. Um, although he's had many number ones, people oftentimes wouldn't associate him like to like, you know, the Garth level or the Kenny Chesney level or uh, whomever. Um, but he's just been like the, the working man, like out there, he plays, he hustles, he does all of the things and, and people love him for that. And they, are loyal to him. And every time he goes to the, whatever city it is, they show up time after time after time, even if he doesn't have a mega hit on his hands, they're still there. And country uh, and rock both have that passion and longevity of career. Yes. It's really interesting that once the fans love you, they love you forever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're, I think a genuine good person, you love, you really appreciate your opportunity. You love, uh, and you're, you're gracious and you're good to people. I think people, uh, you know, reciprocate. Well, I bring all of this up because I want to talk about your new band. And 
There are so many people out there, rock fans, that have loved Days of the New and that have loved Tantric and have seen the band over the years. And for me, as a fan of those projects, when I found out about Blitzkrieg, I was like, wait a minute, that's who that is? And I was so excited for you guys, knowing all of the struggles in the career over the years and knowing what amazing guys you are and what great songwriters and performers that you are. So you get you take a break, you unplug for a while, you go out and you take care of your families and you're living your life and, and getting regular jobs. And then the pandemic hits. Talk to me about how this band started and how you ended up releasing a record in the middle of all of this. It is an incredible story that again, speaking of stars aligning and things just happening that you can't plan. Um, that's how this whole thing has come to be. So during the recording process of the uh, third tantric record that was never released, I found myself going to and from the studio every day and uh, tuning into satellite radio and just trying to decompress and not listen to something that we were working on so that I could just kind of re hit the reset button and get out of my headspace for a little bit. And during that time was a time when uh, Donald Carpenter, our, uh, the singer, uh, his first band uh, called Submersed had their first hit single uh, on satellite radio. It was called Hollow. And I'll never forget the moment I heard that song and his, he began to sing, there's something that just resonated with me to where I immediately went into this headspace of thinking, I bet I could make some killer music with this guy. Like I could see us gelling together. I can see great things for that. Would, it would be awesome. I, I just, I just know it. I just know it. It's like when you walk by a couple and you see the girl and you're like, that's my future wife. Like, Damn it. <laughs> she's with somebody else. And so am I. That's a great analogy. I've never heard that. That's, seriously, though. You are coveting someone else's girl. Yes, I admit. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> so fast forward many years, I actually hadn't even listened to that album in a long time. I'm on the road with Dirk Bentley. This is a, several years ago now. And uh, nightly ritual, kind of the same rock tour stuff. You, you know, you get done with your night, you hop in your bus, crawl in your bunk, try to get a few hours of sleep real quick before you're in the next city. And I throw my earbuds in, hit play on a shuffle playlist and hollow comes on that submerged song. And instantly it's three in the morning. I open my eyes and I'm like, man, I have not listened to this forever. I forgot about this guy. What is he doing? So I like go down the rabbit hole of this Google trying to figure out if he's got more stuff out, you know. It's called and cyber stalking, just so you <laughs> pretty know. Pretty much. So it's called cyber stalking. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he's down. Actually, he's here, right? Uh, not in this room, but he's at my house right now. I, <laughs> I, I need to text him and tell him to come up here if he's not too freaked out. Um, but... <laughs> so basically um i find that there's like a, a lull in the action it looks like where like there's two years preceding that moment where there's just not not a lot of info out there it just seems like he's just he also is kind of taking a break it seems like and i find this instagram page yes i this is totally cyber stalking cyber stalking <laughs> does he know that you are cyber stalking him i hope i hope i'm not breaking up your band before you guys can even get out on the road cuz he's going to find out you were a full blown right. creeper <laughs> they're going to have to keep me in a separate separate quarters <laughs> um so i so this this uh this instagram page i find come to find out later on this is part of the uh, um, amazingness of the story. His uh, his good friend convinced him 24 hours prior to start that Instagram page because he never had one. So he just starts it and I find him 24 hours later in my moment in time at that, that evening or three in the morning. And I just randomly hit him up. I'm like, hey, Todd, I was in Days of the New, I was in Tantric. If you're ever into writing music again, I'd love to get, get together. I'm a big fan of your voice. 
And he replies a couple minutes later. He's like, dude, I'm a big fan of you too. Um, and I would love you to get together. You slid into his DMs. <laughs> This Seriously. is such a modern love story. I know, right? <laughs> oh, we did not send pictures to each other, though, so no. <laughs> and um, so we we go back and forth for a second, and I'm so so I'm like, you know, where where are you out of these days? I'm out of Nashville. He's like, I'm uh, outside of Dallas, and it hits me. I look at the schedule. I'm like, dude. The bus I'm on right now, we are on our way to Dallas right now. He's like, for real? And I was like, dude, if you want to come out to a country concert, I'll get you in and we can at least meet and hang out for a little bit. And he's like, dude, count me in. And that he did. He came out literally that next day and I met him that next day and we've been friends ever since. That's unbelievable. The chance that would have to happen for all of that to align at the same time that you were stalking him online, that he had just put up the page that you were headed to the city where that's insane that that all happened within 24 hours. It seriously is. I got goosebumps as you were talking because it, it really feels like cosmic. I can't really describe it any other way that it was just meant to be. Um, and the way this pandemic, you know, because we had shot ideas back and forth for a few months after our initial meeting in hopes that we would, you know, get together in my studio here one day and that we were going to start working on some music. But when the shutdown happened uh, from the pandemic, that's when my wheels started turning. And, I, and, and as we talked, I, it just became apparent because we at that time it was just him and I talking and he was like, man, what, you know what if we brought Jesse and Matt into the fold? Like, or what are they doing? And just coincidentally, Matt had literally, I think a week before just got himself out of this, this program, this treatment program that he was in. So he had just gotten freed up. Jesse had just gotten in a place where he could come down and make a trip down. And it all just kind of lined up perfectly. Tell me how you call Jesse and Matt and tell them about your cyber stalking abilities and that you meet <laughs> up. Like, did they at all think you were being a creeper or were they like, cool? I left out the creeper part. I made it sound <laughs> totally natural. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I ran across this guy. It's, it's great. It's, he's awesome. <laughs> oh my God, that's amazing. So when was this in the timeline of COVID? I mean, uh, obviously you, you connected pre-COVID because you were on tour. Yes. But then how did you guys, because you were all in different cities when the lockdown started last year, right? That's correct. Yes. And it was not long after, I think probably um, a month and a half after, you know, everybody had been locked down and it started to become really apparent to my, in my judgment that, all right, this is not just going to go away real quick. So I started thinking bigger, like, all right, well, how can we, uh, at least capitalize on the the newfound time that we have and try to make, you know, a silver lining out of this whole mess. And um, so, yeah, that's when I was like, Hey, why don't you guys all drive here and like, we'll converge here in the studio and uh, let's just kind of see what happens. And, you know, it's incredible because at that moment, the on day one, when we collectively show up in this, in the studio space here for our first quote unquote official writing session, I had been uh, throwing out some guitar riffs and some vocal melodies here and there just to kind of get the creative juices flowing, you know, through voice memos and things like that. Um, but nobody knew if it was really going to like work, work, you know, like when we get together, is there going to be magic? Is it going to be really awkward? Are we just not even going to really gel? You know, nobody knows, you know, kind of going back to the whole uh, stalker dating and all that. It's kind of well, like, it's the same analogy. It's like, you don't know, you know, you're nervous about it, but you're optimistic and you're hoping that it's going to work out. It really is kind of amazing that these analogies for relationships are the same analogies as for bands. <laughs> It's really the secret <laughs> to life. If anybody listening right now and they're trying to figure out their band situation, I think we have cracked the code for Seriously. figuring it out how, how to make it work. <laughs> yeah. Just the same way you'd woo a woman. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we got we get together in the same space and literally we we sit down, I grab my guitar, we look at each other. 
I start to play the first thing, the first idea that I kind of had on the forefront of my mind is the first thing to play. And it was literally magic from that moment on. And um, we, in, I think two or three different writing sessions, we basically, we wrote the 10 songs and those 10 songs are the songs that are on the, the album. Uh, we didn't write any more, any less. It was just 10 songs. And um, it felt right, right when we get to, got to the end of song number 10, uh, it just kind of felt complete. It felt like the story was told uh, for that particular piece of art, I'll call it. And um, that's actually what brought them back into town. They're, they're all here at my house right now. And uh, we're, we're taking care of some business as well as writing session and stuff all at the same time. For artists that put a band together, one of the biggest decisions you can make is figuring out what to call yourselves. You've now had to do this three times. So where does the band name come from? I have Jesse to thank for that because I'm a terrible band name guy. Like I think for all the bands, all of my names came from Back to the Future movie. So <laughs> I think they were over that. Like Flux Capacitor is going to be amazing. You know, it's but... None gigawatts we're naming the band gigawatts yes. <laughs> 1.21 gigawatts <laughs> i mean so i'm not good at that <laughs> so jesse um we kind of have this mantra i'll say of um it's kind of an unspoken mantra i suppose that we're all in this headspace to where we we definitely a want our music to be uplifting and have kind of a, a, a positive undertone to it all to where it serves a purpose of, of lifting somebody up by the time they get to the end of it is what our hopes were. Like, I, I think that, uh, especially now, um, there's, there just seems to be socially so much unrest on all different levels uh, in all different age groups. And it just felt right to like, make sure our, we open up our hearts and uh, really put intention into making music that um, had an intention of lifting people up at the end of the day, not, not in a, uh, a way of only talking about rainbows and things like that, but in a way to where there's, like I said, an undertone of something. Uh, some of the songs, for example, tackle uh some of the social unrest topics politically uh without taking sides with anybody but it it just tackles it it um it highlights the fact that there's you know all this unrest going on in the world and there's an undertone of like picking yourself up and being strong and 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 fighting for what you believe in kind of thing um the song the the, the album itself ends with a song called remedy, which is that ended up being the title of the album, um, which it, it basically is a self-describing song of what the remedy is to all the negativity um, that we introduce into our lives, uh, whether it be by accident or by default. Um, but the reason I, sorry to get so long winded. The reason that I set um, the answer up like that is that, it was an important part of the process is that we knew we wanted to just as a band collectively uh, give and hopefully continue to give the world something positive and, and not just a few chords and a few rhyming words. And um, so Jesse, uh, I guess just one day he was driving around and, and, he thought of the word Blitzkrieg, which my instant like connection was Metallica's Kill 'Em All album, the song Blitzkrieg, um, which I'm I'm not a historian, but the little bit that I researched, it was an old term that was coined for, uh, for it was a wartime term, like kind of overwhelming your opponent with uh, from the sky and from the ground and all at once. And uh, so he was like, man, what if we like flip the meaning, made up a word and it, it just it doesn't have to be a, a real word. Right. And so like, let's instead of blitz, let's turn to bliss, which is like more of a euphoric kind of meaning so that it, we kind of imply it's almost like audio bliss, like in a way, like bringing something up, uplifting and blissful uh, into the listener's perspective purview. And uh most people probably won't think of it in those kind of deep terms, but uh, it to well, us. It's it your has band. Meaning. I'm glad there's thought behind it. 
Yeah, me too. You know, we just didn't <laughs> want it to just be some cool sound and whatever. We we wanted it to have meaning. So yeah, um, that's that's how it came about. So I have Jesse uh, to thank for that. Can you talk about the relationship between a rock band and fans? Because over this last year, the rock fans have been isolated, not only from the artists that make the music that we all love, that defines us, which is why I put this podcast together, because our whole lifestyle is is surrounded by this music that kind of is the common thread that holds it all together. But also we've been denied our meeting place, right? That we mm-hmm. can't go to concerts and be surrounded by people that are like us and listen to the music that we all love and get our friends together and you know, go into the city and cram into those clubs and scream and yell and have this cathartic experience that really is something we all love to do and we've been denied that. So from the artist perspective, can you talk about how important the fans are to a rock band and how important those live shows and that connection is? You know, Outside of the bounds of like the artistic portion of the process, it's everything. I will never forget like some of the most important moments that I carry with me are these random moments where I I have actually next to me a picture. I was so um, there is a a radio festival in uh, in Wisconsin that we would typically play uh, every year. And this this one particular festival, uh, we were doing a, a meet and greet where um, I can't remember if it was winners of something or if it was just whoever wanted to show up just just showed up. But with this particular day, a, a lady had her son there. It was his birthday. I think he was maybe nine or ten at the time. And uh, this is uh, when we were out on the road doing our tantric thing. And, and this, this kid, he wanted nothing more than to meet Tantric. And, uh, he was a big fan, loved the album, loved the music. And they patiently stood in line and I was able to hang out with them, sign whatever he wanted, take some pictures, I sung him happy birthday. And, uh, for me in that moment, it was, you know, very fulfilling because I got to see the excitement in, in his eyes and, um, I got to experience the interaction and the connection with another human who was actually uplifted in a positive way by music, which is what, for me, what I really, the grand scheme of things, that's what you hope for is the connection portion of it. I mean, without it, you're just somebody making music in your own room and outside of that, it serves no other purpose other than to self inflate your whatever. And I'll never forget. It was uh, several months later. Uh, we're parked outside within, you know, the kind of short radius of wherever that show took place. We're parked outside of our our venue that night where we're going to play like a club. And we there's a knock at the door and it's a, a lady who hands my tour manager an envelope. And she was like, hey, just want to, you know, if you don't mind, give this to Todd. So he goes, OK, OK, he closes the door and he comes back. He gives me this envelope. And I open the envelope and it's a picture and I recognize it immediately. It's a picture of me and her son. And on the back, um, this isn't verbatim. I'd have to read it, but on the back, it says something like uh, she was so gracious and said that that moment in time made the biggest impact on his life. And he ended up like doing better in school after that and all of these things. And she was, she was like, from a mother, I just want to thank you so much for taking time for him that day. And I'll just remember reading that and just like melting inside and just thinking, this is why we are out here. Like I'm out here at the time. My daughter was really young and I really missed her. And there's times where you just get burnt out and you want to get back home. And then I read that and I'm like, this is why I'm out here. Like, this is why. It's so important to connect with people because there are people who might meet you in a time of need that you have no idea that you're fulfilling something for them in that time of need. And there's nothing more gratifying than that. And they're going to be fans forever because of that five minutes that you spent with them that 
at the time, you didn't realize we're going to be such a profound experience. That's exactly right. It's such a small price to pay to have such a giant impact on somebody forever. How has it been being a parent through this whole mess? For me, it's I'm in a unique position. My I've only got one child, my daughter, and she's 19 now. She's kind of in a she does still live at home, but you know she's kind of hitting that adulthood. You know, I I know everything's dried, (laughs) not in a bad way. You know how you are. You just you're you're 19 and you think you know how everything works already because I'm 19. Um, But it's it's been different. I'm sure that someone with like young children during this pandemic time is completely different because then you have to do I haven't had to deal with like how to deal with uh, the the rules and the boundaries at school and and homeschooling. Yeah. yeah, So I've not had those obstacles to overcome. So I guess your daughter is as old as you were when you were touring with Metallica. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) And seriously, th- that's basically my barometer for life is like, I look at her and I'm like, wait a minute, that's crazy. Like I was your age when I was, and it doesn't feel right because I, I honestly, there's uh, many parts of me that I still feel like that 19 year old kid and I've never lost that. And so uh, it's kind of bizarre thinking of it in those terms, but it's true. Um, I want to ask you about the early days and when you and I met at WAF, because last year, a couple weeks before the lockdown happened, um, WAF went off the air after 50 years, which is how I ended up through this lockdown, starting my podcast and kind of carrying on doing my own thing now. And it's been really interesting to hear artists tell me old stories about what they remember about WAF. And I know that the radio station played a huge part in the early days of days of the news. So do you have any memories of Boston or WAF from the early days of your career? Our in-studio performances were some of the most memorable because of that, because you guys were, it may have been the first, especially a large market outside of like our hometown, smaller mid market, the first large market to embrace us fully and give us a platform and to double that to double down on that and have us like in studio for performances and then having uh you know the shows that were sponsored by you guys like it was really the first time that uh i it, it's almost like i was given a reality check you know going to the 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 studio and um fully getting to having an opportunity to comprehend what everybody behind the scenes there was doing for (laughs) us and the impact that it was going to then have on the trajectory on the rest of our careers. Cause it did. I mean, we, I am still so eternally grateful for you, for everyone there who just blindly supported us because it, 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 for whatever your reasons were, you know, that it felt, am I still here? Oh yeah, yeah, I lost, I lost you for a second. Yeah, I got my you. Uh, internet got- connection all of a sudden said very bad. Oh, I got, I got you now. So, of course, it happens in this nice sentimental moment there. <laughs> yeah, there'll be no good things said here. Yes, you will not say nice things about Mistress Carrie. <laughs> the hell with you. But just to wrap up what I was saying, because I don't know where it got cut off, but um, just so much gratitude for you for everyone there i have nothing but the very best memories of everyone and really you guys played arguably the most important part in the trajectory of our lives that allowed us to even come to this point in time that has us i was going to say face to face but you can't see me but i can see you but uh, voice to voice with each other once again I look forward to being able to be face to face. I look forward to Bliss Creek going out on tour and being able to go and see you and, you know, to get caught up in person, but also just to be able to go back to doing the things that we love, which is going to shows and discovering new bands and 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 living that part of our lives that has been put on hold for so long. You better believe it. It's just so crazy, isn't it? How some of the things that were so that that you just take for granted that the normalcy of life 
gets pulled from you. And then all of a sudden you're like, how do we get back to that? And it feels so foreign now. I look at pictures of interviews and and concerts and you see video. I just watched this documentary called Long Live Rock about you know, the relationship between the artists and these big giant rock festivals with tens of thousands of people squished against each other. And it seems so weird now. And it's something that we all just did so normally before. Yeah. I mean, that painted a picture for me. There's, uh, I think somebody's posted it on YouTube. They, uh, the Latrobe festival that we did uh, for Rolling Rock Town Fair. This was, 2001 ish. And there had to have been a hundred thousand people out there, you know, and everybody just jumping against each other and, you know, barely any clothes on and everybody just going crazy. And it's hard to imagine that right now coming back. I do pray that there are people who are actually doing studies um into there's, there's got to be some research going on as to sure how this is so. affecting all of us yeah i hope that people just aren't taking blanket statements as truth and that there's people actually getting scientific about impacts of you know large gatherings and uh you know what's safe and not safe because if that's not being done that would be heartbreaking i started asking bands this question because the answers have always been really interesting. So I'm going to ask you this question. As a songwriter, what song from any artist of any time do you wish that you wrote? Hmm. That's a great... Hmm. And the answers have been very interesting. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a super complicated song. It doesn't have to be something that was commercially successful it doesn't have to be a rock artist it doesn't have to be from this era but as a songwriter and someone that has spent their entire adult life and most of your childhood writing songs yourself is there a song that you just look at and you say okay that's a perfect example of great songwriting I wish I wrote that song wow I don't know if I've ever been asked that question. That's why um, it's a good question. And I, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back because it's yeah, my question. You should. And I'm going to ask it from now on of artists because I am not a songwriter and I'm not a musician and I don't have that ability and I wish that I did. And it's really interesting to hear people that do have that ability um, kind of covet a, a song that someone else was able to to put together that inspired you or that you just, you know, you could listen to it a million times and never get sick of it. The only, I guess I have two. two. All right, you give me two. The first, and and the first one's probably going to be surprisingly over or underwhelming, but it's, I just freaking love this song. Um, Creep by Stone Temple Pilots. It's just like one of those songs. In fact, that whole core record, I talk about this all the time. That that whole album resonates with me in a way that like I could pretty much listen to that album uh, every day and not get sick of it. Um, it's a great song. I mean, it, it, it still gets played every day on the radio because it's good. <laughs> like, Yeah, I mean, it. it's a... Fabulous song and just the way that the honestly they incorporated the the acoustics combined with the electrics. I guess that kind of that has a special place in my heart. Well, that's um, why as a songwriter, like I want to know about the parts of it that make it so special for you. Yeah, that that's it. I mean, the, combining the slide, the, the there's almost the uh, the dobro slide guitar, and then it comes in with the uh, uh, you know the electrics they incorporate, and so I guess it's really that for that song, it's a it's a texture song, but then his story, um, is a story you know that touches on somebody who's recognizing their faults, basically, and. I feel like that's my life story. <laughs> so that really resonates with me. Um, and then the other that I was going to mention, Temple of the Dog, Times of Trouble oh. is another that just, uh, it's. I just feel like it's brilliant. From it, Again, Chris Cornell's lyrics are just absolutely brilliant in that song. And again, it's, it, musically, 
it takes you on an absolute journey from that 12 string acoustic guitar that starts in the beginning um, to the masterfully, what I consider masterfully, masterfully recorded drum sound. Um, it just, you feel like you're there in the room with them every time that you, every time I listen to that whole record, but especially that song. It's one I, of my favorite albums of all time. Same. I mean, it, it's, you know, I look back, I mean, obviously when we lost Chris Cornell, it just devastated everyone. And I was lucky enough to interview him several times and he came up on my show one day, just him. And he was on a solo tour and he came up and brought his guitar with him and he played acoustic in the studio. Like you were talking about, like so many bands over the years, including yours have come up to the studio and played acoustic and he played a solo acoustic version of call me a dog that oh. brought me to tears. And I still listen to it and it just floored me at how raw and emotional and that version of that song, because I hold that whole record up in such high regard. Like it's one of my favorite albums of all time. That Me Temple of too. the Dog record. It's oh, I so would have loved to have been a fly on the wall that oh. day that he was in there singing that for you. Like, and, oh, and you know, what's crazy is that his wife was there with him, Vicky, his widow now, obviously. And he was so candid that day talking about, his struggles with depression and how he had dealt with all of the things that he dealt with over the years. And when he died, I, I pulled that audio back out and, and aired it. And, and it comes, I, I have to apologize to the people that listen to every episode of the podcast because certain things come up all the time. This is one of the things that comes up all the time that rock and roll specifically I'm not going to speak on other genres because I don't know as much about other genres, but when you're a person that is struggling with anything and you pour those struggles into music, a Chester Bennington, a Travis Meeks, a Chris Cornell, and anyone that's going through personal struggle and you put it in the music, because there's no doubt that all of that pain from Chris Cornell was in his music. You, you could hear it all, like you just said. Mm -hmm. And we consume it as a product, us fans, that we, that, that we buy it, that we quote it, that we listen to it, that we pay to go and see you perform it. And in some cases as an artist, it's like a product of the worst pain of your life. And I never really thought about it until we lost Chris Cornell and then lost Chester Bennington right after. And all of a sudden, I felt guilty as a fan because the the outreach for help was in all the lyrics. And every day that they went on stage, they had to play that music that and relive that pain for our enjoyment. And it's something over the last year, especially since the lockdown and since the pandemic and since I started this podcast, that I've been looking at going, what a strange thing. What a weird relationship between the music fan and the artist that we're consuming, not only your best days and the fun, amazing music that you make, but also the, the pain of it. It just seems so strange to me now. It, it is a beautiful thing to have someone so honest and open like that in their art form and i'll say at least the glass half full side of it is and we'll never know but for some of them the fact that they were out playing the music and reliving those moments it could have been something that allowed them to exist for longer because it maybe they gave them a little it was therapeutic to a point or well, like you talked about meeting the fan and having it mean so much to you yes that i can only hope as a fan that loved his music we're talking about chris cornell specifically i can only hope that that love that he felt that from all of us in the admiration of the art that he created i can only hope that i sure hope so i mean what a blessing he was to all of us um 
and so many of them like Chester, like it, I mean, so many, I mean, you could just go down a long list, but Scott Weiland in the same yes. thing. I mean, there's so much amazing music that came out of so much pain, but um, it just really struck me. And I think about it a lot as I'm having these conversations and I know part of it is when I was on the radio, these conversations had to be really fast, right? You know, you're playing all this music on the radio. You got to get your commercials in on time. It's been really interesting taking my career into podcasting where I can just have a long conversation with someone like yourself where we can discuss this stuff and and bring it up and talk about it where I don't think that would have been possible in the way that we were doing things with radio before. And I never really analyzed it that much. And over this last year, it's kind of forced me. Maybe it's because I just didn't have anything else to do because I was <laughs> locked in the house. But um, it seemed really strange in a way and when you talk about songwriting and the songs that you love it obviously if you're going to list a temple of the dog song as one of the songs that you wish that you had written as a songwriter that that impact was there from his art yeah yeah i mean he and honestly i speak i believe for donald as well uh, has such an impact on this whole band. And, and Donald is actually our, uh, our singer, Donald Carpenter. He's a guy who uh, is very open about his struggle with, um, he, he's with bipolar uh, personality and things that he, he's constantly working through and doing work to, you know, just figure it out and, and, and pick his head up and, and with the depression aspect and everything. And, uh, he too is somebody again, that just pours his heart out, uh, when he sings. And so, um, I know that for him, when he opens himself up, even when he's feeling in a dark place, uh, the art of it and the process is a very healing thing. Um, so at least there's the silver lining you know, the, it might not apply to everybody. I can't really give a blanket statement, but I, I can say from his perspective, it's a, it's a very healing process, the creative portion of it. Well, I am so grateful that you hung out with me for so long today. I'm so happy that Bliss Krieg is together and starting something new out of this crazy year plus of our lives. And um, I'm so glad that you guys are doing so great because it's been so long and watching the trajectory of your career and the ups and downs and the same thing with mine and, you know, for the, for the album remedy to have come out just in February. And I know that the band wants to be able to get out on the road and, and to be able to bring in old fans and new fans alike. And I just can't wait until we can actually sit down and reminisce in person face to face it i look forward to it i cannot wait either and to your point i think it's just absolutely refreshing to be able to have this format where we can have longer conversations like this i think that it's fun oh my gosh it's incredible it really is and and it's it's an absolute blast to be on this end of it and i cannot thank you enough oh, for please. giving us the platform and giving me the time today and being able to catch up just as old friends it has been awesome i am possibly uh coming to nashville later on in the summer if things go right so if you're going to be around, I'm going to I'm going to call you up and see if we can go and get a beer somewhere. Or I'm going to hold you to that. You, I would love you that. have to look me up if you yeah, do that. I would absolutely love to do that. Todd, thank you so much. Thank you. It's just been a blessing, a pleasure, and I'll do it anytime. Huge thanks to Todd from Bliss Creek. It was so nice to get caught up. And of course, the band's debut album, Remedy, is available right now. A bunch of the songs we talked about, not only from Bliss Creek, but Days of the New, Tantric, and all of the other music we discussed, are in the corresponding playlist with this episode. I make a playlist for every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast. Also linked in the show notes, all of Todd's social media accounts, the website for Bliss Krieg, and everything else you need to know. 
So if you liked what you heard, don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss anything from the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes every Wednesday. Plus, every weekday, you get the sit rep, all your rock news and music headlines in under five minutes. And if you don't mind, leave us a five-star review and a comment so we know what you thought. Huge thanks once again to DCU, Digital Federal Credit Union at dcu.org and mistresscarry.com for sponsoring this week's episode. Join me every Tuesday night live on my Facebook page at 8.30 for Cocktails in the War Room. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. Progressive presents Adjusting to the Suburbs. I never thought I'd care about gardening until I bought a house in the suburbs. But now I find myself in conversations about liquid fertilizer, and I wonder, am I the fertilizer guy now? (laughs) No, no way. Everyone knows the ratio between phosphorus and nitrogen, right? Yeah, I'm still totally cool. Anyway, when you save with Progressive by bundling your home and auto, that's the easy part of adjusting to the suburbs. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers.